fact, uh, uh, the pleasure is mine that uh, Professor Namrata has explained about uh, many of the things uh, which, which made my uh, talk much more easy. As I just quickly get into the, the topic, and she explained that the stratified personalized uh, uh, care in ophthalmology, where we try to focus on individualization, I always try to look at this way, uh, the way how this uh, cancer diagnostics or cancer treatment went on when it went for uh, individualization. As we understand that most of the cases, about more than 70% of, uh, uh, more than 70% of the uh, drugs, whatever we are using it, they're all coming from, you know, uh, the, the diseases other than ophthalmology where we are trying to extrapolate it for our conditions. Therefore, when you just try to individualize any uh, drug therapy, we also look forward for uh, some sort of uh, some sort of an algorithm where we can utilize them. When we talk, whenever we try to interpret the data about uh, you know GI studies or metagenomics or epigenomics or metabolomics, anything which you are trying to put it inside, we try to look forward for a handful of agents where we can use it comfortably. And when it comes to using this kind of agents, the second problem comes up is that. About, uh, about how to use them, about how to use the appropriate strategy to make it possible. For example, that is coming into some sort of a drug delivery system in this case. But mostly that when you just look at, uh, by and large, when you try to look into the personalized medicine from the cancer perspective, uh, you know, that just, I'm not going into the details about it, about the different types of approaches where we can individualize uh, a drug therapy where we are trying to find, figure it out, the pharmacokinetics of a drugs in alter the state, where the disease state, and genome editing, or we are trying to have a gene therapy, or stratifying patients based on biomarker genetic information, as Professor Namrata has talked about it, or we are trying to characterize specific barriers to reach target tissues, of course. This is one thing which uh, ocular uh, drugs, which I always look forward for, because we have some specific problem. Here, uh, blood ocular barriers is something that which we cannot just give a drug systemically, and we expect that to go to eye. As I always say, show that eye behaves like an island and it has its own, its own autonomy in case of uh, every pharmacokinetics when it comes to picture. Creating autol autologous cell therapies or cell-based therapies, again, again, it is having a limitation. You know, whenever we are trying to answer any question regarding personalized medicine, the first question which comes to is how good you are choosing the, uh, the condition for which the drug is indicated. So you're trying to get epigenetics, you're trying to transcriptome or proteome or genome, any data which is coming inside uh, in any particular ocular disease or when you're trying to understand the disease. A fundamental understanding of the disease along with the tangible uh, treatment for or the tangible uh, pharmacological remedy, that's the only, uh, only uh, combination which is going to work synergistically when it comes to personalized medicine. I think it was about 20, 25 years back when you look at pharmacology and the way how it has described, developed in ocular use, I, I always see that, you know, we had only a very handful of agents from autonomic, uh, uh, autonomic drugs and uh, some of these antibiotics which came from other, other disease conditions, et cetera. But now we have much more, uh, much more thing coming up from other area where we are expecting more from biologicals. Biological is the most important area where we are looking at. Look, when I just look at this grassly, it is something which came in our laboratory sometime back. I thought it would be interesting for all of you to understand. This publication came up. Some sort of, you know, what these guys from uh, University of Tumingen, about uh, three years back, this publication came up that human common cells producing novel antibiotic impair pathogen colonization. Especially, this took the swab from the nose and they identified uh, Staphylococcus lugdunensis and the University of uh, Tübingen, and that uh, antibiotic which was secreted by a microbe in the nose of a common uh, of a man, which is keeping the mucosal surface dry, and surprisingly, this is also effective against MRSA. So something like you know we often often uh, we thought about it is that uh, you know I wonder often about it is that then you know a person who is even taking bath in a water or a river. Where, which is left, where, where, where we isolate organisms with, uh, with um, high uh, resistant bacteria, still he is not getting infection and he is absolutely resistant for it. We thought, okay, immune system is making some sort of, uh, uh, we have been trying to explain by immune system, but you will not believe. When we, with this paper appeared, immediately when the discussions, whatever we had in our laboratory, 
Immediately we thought that if it is there in the nose, we expect the same thing in the eye too. So if so, you might look for it for lutein in the eye also. It's the first antibiotic, cyclic antibiotic, which is cyclic. Now what we did is that we quickly just got into this uh, method development for this particular antibiotic, which is found in the nose of a human. And I know I, I think uh, uh, I took my consumer, I believe that, and along with my some some of my interested volunteers, they just took that consumer, sorry, uh, tear off of ours. And when we try to check it up, surprisingly, yes, we are getting in the eye. This this arrow indicates that how nicely we could separate it out and quantify it immediately. I just discussed with. Uh, some of my clinical colleagues and now we are thinking of you know going ahead with how this is getting altered in a disease condition uh, you know so far we know lysosomes we know about lactoferrins but for the first time we are seeing lignin which is a multispectrum antibiotic which is acting against against mrsa is found in the tear form that's a very surprising finding of it so look what it what it gives us more what what it understand what it gives uh, the information what it gives is, is that the disease process, what we are understanding as of now, is much more complicated than we think of. It's not purely because of genetic factors, the epigenetic factors, as well as other things like even microbiome. Who expects that microbiome to play a role when it comes to eye and case of infection? And this is another same one that we are trying to do the metabolomic profiling of uh, genetics, sorry, especially uh, those who are with the Dakuma POG and PC, VACG. In this case, you know, the metabolomics showed a different, uh, altogether different, uh, different thing. And you know, due to which we got two striking findings. Again, you see, I always, I mean, uh, when the clinical discussions, we always results in that. We are getting patients also not responding to beta blockers, not responding to lactose, I mean, prostaglandin and logs, or they are not responding to uh, adrenergic agents. So those things, whenever we try to look into it, so we thought that, that the best way is that let, let us look into the metabolomic profile so we thought there's a multiplicity, again, when it comes to Gakuma, again, the multiplicity. It's not that one single drug which is capable of handling all, of, all those things, as Professor Amrita has mentioned in one of her slides very nicely, that there cannot be one, uh, one, dry, one, one size which can fit for all. Now, now we need to be, we are getting the, uh, different differences in different types of glaucoma, but how do we identify it? So what, what is the way to which we identify the biomarker that are, you try to, you know, same like when I just apply the same principle of can script or liquid biopsy when it happens in the oncologic treatments. When I try to apply this to ophthalmology, I find that where would I look into it? How would I tap a consumer? Now, now, now things are coming up slowly. You know, the amniocentesis can be done. I think that Dr. Professor Namrata will definitely be happy to get me a small amount of therapeutic uh, consumer to do all those things and say that, well, I can go for personal infection. I'm telling you that this is going to be the future of ours. So when, when, when we went inside and understanding what about this metabolomics between responders and non-responders, significantly we could see that somewhere histidine metabolism is getting highly affected. And whenever we just histidine was affected, immediately when we went on profiling all downstream histidine metabolic products, especially as a neurotransmitter, and you will not believe that we got a striking uh, 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 observation. The histamine levels were very much elevated in POAG, which has not been reported. You know, that histamine H3 receptor involvement in glaucoma has been reported by somebody. Somebody used it to reduce intraocular pressure. But we never thought that histamine is going to play. We never thought for long years, for last 40, 50 years, nobody bothered about it. First time we got it recently, this paper is accepted in my research. Just, uh, just it's a very striking observation. This supposed to finding that we might have one more group of drugs, S3 blockers for glaucoma. So similarly, that the another important thing is just now again another paper is going on, which is about PEA. That is, uh, this another agent which is involved in the in the adrenergic pathway. This agent is again having a similar tendency that of adrenaline when it is secreted inside not adrenaline when it is secreted in the in the uh, ciliary process, it can increase the consumer production, and that has been upregulated. Is another finding which came out of metabolomic profile. So in that case, if I have, if I come to know that okay, this is the problem with this patient, probably we look into this. But you know, always, you know, my colleagues, whenever I hear about them working about different polymorphism, genetic polymorphism, my question always comes up with that: so what? How am I going to treat it with pharmacological agents? So I have the, our, my approach is always about, about that. What is the pathway which is getting affected, a downstream pathway where I can manipulate, manipulate it by using pharmacology. 
Similarly, I think sometime back when we, I think most of you, uh, those who are in the IERG must be familiar with our studies about, about lipidomics, lipidomics profile, about the amount of uh, the lipidomics getting altered along with the different disease conditions, especially when you look into the mucin deficiency or it is in a, yeah, or even, even with a cataract, uh, sorry, contact lens usage or with, uh, you know, uh, uh, corneal refractory surgeries or in case of, uh, you know, uh, uh, steroid deficient, uh, deficiency, especially uh, postmenopausal dry, dry eye, in all these conditions, the type of uh, the lipid composition, the outer lipid composition, which is affecting that your pulp, that is changing. So again, you know, it is giving us another indication that uh, that is a uh, personalization is required when it even comes for a dry eye. So next is when you come to, uh, when, I, when we just come into the picture of uh, how eye drug has been handled by the, uh, by eye, I think this is one of our uh, uh, in a wonderful publication, the proof of concept in that, you know, where we try to label the uh, antibiotic, especially here we took ofloxacin, which is a substrate for PGP, and when we injected in the eyes of the rabbit along with the PGP blocker, we did not see that being excreted from the eye. We see the bright white dots are not allowing to, us to see the bladder, and as you can see in the control rabbit, you can see the bladder, though that is getting eliminated very fast. So optimization of the drug, Again, the presence of drug transporters at different places, which is again playing that the drug we give systemically is not reaching the eye. If we inject the eye, it goes off. It also explains, I think, once we were writing a paper with uh, Professor Tara Prasad about uh, how the endophthalmite is, why we choose only few drugs out of big clinical trials, that we could easily prove it by, by this strategy that what type of drugs can be injected inside which can stay, or which type of antibiotics quickly eliminated from the eye. So we could easily come out uh, from our experimental studies what the big clinical trials proved. I think it has been quickly, we could transform this data into a, a drug molecule which are suitable for eye. So somewhere we are going so, so particular about personalization, hope that we'll be able to handle it. When it comes to drug delivery, drug delivery, I always look as a complementary for a pharmacological agent. Not individually I look drug delivery because I try to use drug delivery to solve my problem in pharmaceutical uh, nature of a drug. And the major problem was, uh, Professor Nagarta was talking about, one of our major problem is that so look, whenever we try to look into the eye, whenever we go for personalization, there is uh, the, the amount of market which is available for you is very small. In the small type of market that the, the, the intention of pharmaceutical companies to come forward for, to support the finding or to make it up into clinical use for uh, commercialization is very low. So this kind of thing, whether it is a heartburn drug or rat diseases or region-specific requirement, changing routes of drug administration, unpreserved drug, so several limitations for which you know we try to even use, we try to use the extemporaneously dispensed drugs. This is something that you know we are capable of handling it so far for the last uh, several years, more than 30 years, and to handle several problems of the, uh, the drug-related problems when it comes to clinical practice. I think the increased uh, drug resistance, I think every time, the, now and then, whenever our clinicians are just post, post with this kind of problem, I'm having drug resistance. I have to use this drug, I don't know how to do it. So all these cases, we went on for extemporaneously drug formulations. We have a big list of drugs in which we try to do it. But there is the bigger problem is, I am using it, and we are using it at RP Center, where others are not able to use. I mean, often we get requests from different, uh, different institutions that can be able to help us in this case. So we came out with a small technology to handle this kind of problem. So when you just broadly classify the ocular disorders and the ocular uh, problems in the infection, inflammation, and, uh, you know, um, and the glaucoma and the angiogenesis related problems, we have a handful of agents, but there are multiplicity of, uh, you know, uh, uh, multiple dimensions through which we'll be able to approach what we are lagging behind is how to personalize this. This is only possible as we have discussed already, that somewhere we're trying to figure it out how to tap, how to figure it out, how to make an algorithm, how to involve our artificial intelligence in this case to make it possible. So these things which we, we get to answer these things. So, so finally that, uh, you know, uh, when we just, we come to uh, the next last portion of my talk is that when we come to drug delivery, the drug delivery is the last part when we I look into it, when we solve a problem for a particular agent, if I'm not able to use it for I, I'll try to look into a most probable solution from pharmaceuticals that is drug delivery. Till then, I will always stay more on, on pharmacotherapy. I try to understand the disease process. I try to do everything. So now this is a way that lastly that uh, ascorbic acid is something that which is known to us for a long years. And it has been extensively used for corneal epithelial healing as well as, you know, 
alkali burns etc but thing is that it's not available and though the people affected by kania due to alkaline uh, injury are very many in, in in india but we are not able to produce this ascorbate eye drops because of a major problem that is its, its stability so which recently we just came out with uh, a small technology i think this is recently been presented by us so i just show you quickly this is a small device just trying in nature which um, in which the the ascorbic acid is separately kept in the container and the liquid which is uh, to be used is kept separately in a uh, in a uh, uh, in a small vial and both of them are sterile when this at this is a small instrument when it is attached and uh, just gently you pressurize it so the liquid transfer to the solid it is reconstituted immediately and it can be used for uh, patients even if you want to go for every hour installation or two hours installation it's possible to a quick emergency therapy similarly for this case can be used for vancomycin you can go for a lot of um, i mean uh, uh, antibiotics you will be able to use it by using this as well as you can also use biologicals by using the same technique and this would be of a great use for the remote areas as well as you know we also look into the places like africa where there is so much of alkaline injuries where you have no other uh, possibility and this will also bring boriconazole as an eye drop uh, which is very easy for the patient to reconstitute i think uh, this is a first step step forward for us to bring personalized medicine to somebody's home by using the patient can do them themselves about all this kind of thing so to summarize my talk here that personalized medicine and ophthalmology an upcoming reality absolutely true but diagnostic aqueous paracentesis this is one question which can give us something similar to that of can script or uh, cancer diagnostics metabolomic lipidomic profiling to predict drug therapy or engaging artificial intelligence can access can help us to come out with uh, a solid uh, synergy some appropriate appropriate drug delivery approach to enable complex physiochemical nature of drugs that i come in only at the last whenever we try to do this kind of discovery so i, I must acknowledge many of my students uh, many of my students and many of my colleague clinical collaborators professor tyal professor tanu dada professor namta sharma they all work together to make many of these things possible and thank you very much uh, dr rohit and dr chitra professor namrata for giving this opportunity thank you very much Thank <music> you.